Hey everyone, well this video is brought to you by Next Phase Rugby. It's an app that connects high school rugby players with collegiate programs uh, in a safe and smart way that allows you to talk about your rugby resume and your academic resume and find the college that's right for you where you could also play some great rugby and you never know, get a little bit of money to help you pay for college, whether it's through the rugby program or simply advice from the rugby program to see where you can get aid uh, through your academic performance and uh, some other background that you have. Um, wanted to thank University of Kentucky, who is on the Next Phase Rugby app, by the way, um, for adding to the backdrop there. So thanks a lot, Gary. And we're going to talk a little bit about high school nationals. Yes, I can't believe it's actually here. I've been thinking about it, talking about it for so long and then it seemed like it was still far off and then, you know, this happened and that happened and running different tournaments and it's this week. So I was looking at the matchups and trying to get an idea as to maybe not how it's going to pan. I'm not going to give you predictions quite so much as to see how they make the decisions here. Okay, so uh, the Golf Rugby Report rankings do have an influence on how the seedings are put together, but it's not the only thing. There's there's um, competitive balance within uh, regions, for one thing. There's the idea that you don't want to just load up lots of teams from one region into a bracket because then, you know, they're traveling across country to play each other. Um, that will happen, probably, but it's not going to happen a lot. If we look at the club bracket, uh, Granite Bay, in my opinion, is way at the top at the moment. Um, maybe chased by Woodlands, but I think Granite Bay is is the favorite going in. That's a pretty tough place to be. Uh, and we've seen favorites get undercut before. And then taking on the SOC Raptors, and the SOC Raptors, while they didn't win a lot of games in the region in Southern California, uh, because they're in a hugely competitive region with Belmont Shore, San Diego, and Thunder Rugby, they did pretty well, and the games they lost were very competitive. This is not a game that Granite Bay can afford to take lightly. So while some teams can sort of say, we're going to have a quarterfinal lineup, slightly younger players maybe, um, uh, some players will be rested, things like that. I don't know if Granite Bay can afford to do that. Uh, opposite their bracket, well, you've got the San Diego Mustangs who lost Southern California by a try. One tier two last year, perfectly capable of actually going all the way here. And they're taking on United. And that's another thing. United has gone all the way through uh, Utah without really being challenged, except by Harriman in a game that wasn't a, a conference game for them, 24-24 tie. Uh, United has won before. United has coaching staff who understands how you win at nationals. And sometimes they've come in sort of limping in, like, you know, with a five and three record or something and gone all the way to the final. Uh, United knows how to deal with the three games in three days grinder that's going on here. So it's a Granite Bay probably going to win their first round. The favorite two, okay? The favorite two. But whoever they take on in the second round, that's going to be a barn burner. Um, on the opposite side of the bracket, we already have an opener with Aspatuck versus Belmont Shore. Uh, Aspatuck's a very, very good rugby team. And uh, yeah, yes, they lost by, what was it, 28 or so uh, to St. Ignatius, but they scored two tries against St. Ignatius. Not too many teams do that uh, against their front uh, their front group. And um, they can explode. They can, they can bring a try out of nowhere, and they can also grind it out. And they're taking on a Belmont Shore team that's never really seen them, and they've never really seen Belmont Shore. So uh, that's a game that you really have to circle and say, now the Belmont Shore is officially favored because they're seeded higher. And why are they seeded higher? Because they won Southern California. And uh, we rank them high because they play tough teams all the time. And we know they're tough because Thunder Rugby won the whole thing last year. Raptors did quite well. San Diego won Tier 2. We know these teams are capable of beating other teams uh, elsewhere in the country. And uh, they've returned a number of their players. So that's why we can look at Belmont Shore. And even if they haven't played outside their region, we can say, yeah, they're pretty good. Also note that um, Woodlands beat Thunder and beat the Raptors, but they were very close games. Raptors beat Tempe, very close. Tempe lost to Granite Bay, very close. So those those linkages there, essentially saying, in my mind, Raptors, Mustangs, maybe Thunder, and, and by extension, Belmont Shore are all relatively equal with 
Woodlands Granite Bay. Tempe plays Woodlands. This is, as I said, you know, they've, they've had some common opponents there and, and the scores have been comparable. Woodlands end up on the winning side, Tempe on the losing side. Woodlands has played outside their region a little bit more. Um, and they were semifinalists last year. I think they're good enough to be a finalist this year. They could actually win it all. They are very deep and that's very important. So that's how you look at that the the, the seedings there, and there was the, the the seedings were really looked at. It said uh, uh, Granite Bay, Woodlands, Belmont Shore, and United were your top four. But then you have to sprinkle around the Southern California teams and make sure they don't get loaded in that they're playing each other in the first round. Nobody wants that. Um, we do have a situation though that if um, the Raptors and the Mustangs have the same result, either both win or both lose, they'll play each other in the second round. In the school uh, division, this is an interesting thing to me, and it seems to me that seven and eight might struggle a little bit. Um, and number eight, Xavier, is a team that, that they lost to number seven, Greenwich. There was a thought that maybe Xavier might not even make it to the top tier. Um, and, and an aside here, because it's come up, I think, uh, their representatives of the teams that we're talking about are on the high school nationals panel, uh, Penn, Xavier, Gonzaga, all represented on the high school nationals panel. Also Kansas City Junior Blues who are not going. Uh, I'm on the panel as well. Now, every single, but well, with the exception of Gonzaga, because Gonzaga knew they were good, right? So they weren't saying put us in tier two. Um, there was no reason for them to say that. But the representatives from Xavier and Penn said, yes, you put us in tier two. If, and, and if you don't think the team is good enough to go to nationals, then don't invite that team. Uh, in fact, last year, Penn didn't go. And Penn didn't go because they felt that they weren't competitive enough to go there. So that's the sort of thing where uh, some people think that it's sort of political and everybody's just feathering their own nest. And I really have to say that they're not. Um, you have a lot of very honest people there trying to get the best competition possible. If, if Bishop Dwenger had shown somewhat stronger in high school, in, in, in the high school championship in, in the Midwest, then uh, Xavier probably would have been in tier two. Dwenger struggled a little bit. They did win a game, but they won a game in which they scored three tries and the other team scored four tries. They won on conversions. It doesn't discount the score. But it does make you think, you know, how strong are they? And so that's kind of the question is whether Dwenger would go into the top tier or not. Uh, so it wasn't, it was a decision made by non-Xavier people to put them up there. Be careful what you wish for. Xavier plays St. Ignatius. St. Ignatius, in my mind, is clearly one of the top two uh, school teams in the nation. De La Salle, I believe, is the other one. We've got them ranked number one at the moment because De La Salle beat the number one club team. And uh, they're done for the season. Their, their graduation is this weekend. They're done for the season. So it's going to be very hard for them to build on that. Uh, St. Ignatius, probably the best team in the nation. Uh, in that, you can take certain elements out of that group and they can still perform exceptionally well. They're not relying on three or four or five players or even two players. And a lot of teams are very good. Like they might be a... A seven, seven and a half out of ten, one through fifteen, except for two or three guys who are a, a, like a nine out of ten player. Um, I would say Ignatius uh, is um, higher than that all across the board, individually, but mostly as a unit, and the sum of the parts make them better. Uh, the opposite of their bracket: St. Thomas Aquinas versus Jesuit. So here's the thing: where you've got Aquinas has done really well, lost to Woodlands, but has played teams outside their region, won, won well in other uh, clashes. But overall, their strength of schedule is not super strong because of where they're located. Jesuit Sacramento haven't traveled much. They traveled a little bit, though. Uh, but their competition has been exceptionally strong every week in Northern California. We've seen the scores. We, we know because of just a little bit of connections we talked about with Tempe, uh, playing Granite Bay, things like that, uh, and Jesuit going to Southern California to play the single school teams down there. Dallas Al winning the All-California Championship. 
All of these little connections tell us that not only De La Salle, not only uh, Granite Bay, but San Francisco Golden Gate, Danville, Marin, uh, Motherlode, these are all strong teams. So when Jesuit plays this group and ends up with basically a 500 record, uh, it's actually not something you say, well, they're not playing very well. They're actually right there. I mean, like every game they play, it seems like the score is 33 to 17. Uh, Jesuit, again, is one where their, their culture and their coaching staff, even though they had switch in coach, some switch in this coaching staff as head, head coach a couple of years ago, they know how to win a three-game tournament and a three-day tournament. So Jesuit is certainly a team that nobody wants to, to play and several coaches have said that to me um tim clumpers at st thomas aquinas is like yes bring it on let's have this challenge i think it's a great matchup to have uh but that's why they put it in there because it's like what you have are two teams that you know are good but unsure how good they are you put them at four and five harriman uh, they just lost the utah final and it's kind of a goofy one again you know sometimes you look at it and say Overall, how many times would that happen? Would they lose to Highland again next week or something like that? A um, couple of factors maybe lent themselves to that. But in the end, they lost the game. Uh, so that makes them seem a little bit vulnerable. They lost uh, a game very early in the season. Uh, maybe that seems like they're vulnerable now. They tied United. Maybe that seems like they're vulnerable now. Who knows? But they're still an exceptional uh, outfit. They're the defending national champions. Very athletic. So what do you do? You should put them up against Staples. And how great is that? Because then Staples is an excellent team that maybe we're not quite sure where they are, but we know they're quite strong. This could be an upset. This could be a terrific upset there. Gonzaga against Greenwich. I think it's likely Gonzaga is going to win that one. We've already seen that one uh, happen. The thing about Greenwich and Staples, though, is that I, I, I think they're two teams that, that don't get phased very easily. And it was very interesting to watch the first round last year, St. Ignatius going in against Greenwich. And Greenwich uh, really put a scare into St. Ignatius. And it was a really good lesson for St. Ignatius that they came away, I think it was 10 to seven in the end. You know, they, they dropped the ball in the try line. They, they tried to force it as another, there was a tap penalty that they probably shouldn't have taken, things like that. Po you know, kick for points that they passed up. All these things that um, the emotion of national championship brings up. And, and Greenwich was actually very poised in that one. And they've got a lot of talent. So just because they're seated as low as they are uh, in number seven, Still watch out for them. And finally, Tier 2. Now, the way that Tier 2 was put in is it turned out that there are four Indiana teams there. So simply put, you say, well, we're going to take four Indiana teams over here, and the non-Indiana teams are going to play each other. There's nothing can be done about whether Indiana teams play each other in round two or three, but certainly in round one, make sure that uh, they don't play each other. So uh, Dwenger against Thunder. I think you look at Dwenger was close to getting top tier in school. But I uh, actually slid down a little bit. Thunder, um, def this is great. Defending national club champions is in tier two. That shows you the competitiveness of every everyone. They they could well win tier two quite easily. Pendleton, very strong club team, uh, but we're not quite sure how strong of a, of a list of opponents they've had against Vienna. Very strong club team uh, that's had some good results, but uh, a little bit bumpy road as well. So I think that's an excellent matchup to say, right, really. They're also relatively new on the scene, relatively new on the scene. It's like, can you take the next step? Let's, let's see, let's go. It's like a duel. Which, which one of you can take the next step? Uh, Penn versus Raleigh. Penn is probably... Well, Penn could have, you know, I actually think the Penn is strong enough to be in the tier, top tier in uh, the school bracket. Um, Raleigh, up and down. Um, I think that's probably, I would say Penn is favored in that one. And then Charlotte Tigers against Royal Irish. Um, and that's kind of a fascinating one because that's the uh, last year's finalist against Royal Irish, who was the finalist the previous time they had nationals. And uh, Royal Irish has... Um, I don't think that they've dipped so much as a lot of teams are up at that level now. So it's much harder. So you've got to play those other opponents and beat them on a regular basis. Royal Irish came away with a couple of wins recently, both of them by one point. And it's like, well, is that enough to bump you up to the top tier? It's a tough one. I think they wanted to be in the top tier, but they're going to have to prove it now. Um, and, and you see them take on the Tigers, and the Tigers, their club split, and the other half of 
the team that, that split is going to be in Florida, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, it's a very young Tigers team. So I hope that gave you a little bit of insight as to what people are thinking when they're, they're looking at the seeds and they're looking at uh, how high school nationals gets assembled. But I really want to stress, because I've seen it happen all the time, that the, the people who make these decisions are doing it in the best interests of the tournament and getting the champion. They're not doing it in the interests of some kind of glory reflecting back on their program, because all of those people have had glory, plenty of glory, reflected back on that program. They don't need it, to be honest. So um, if you are reluctant to apply for nationals because you think somehow it's political or there's some backroom deal, it's really not that way. You should apply. Uh, you get in because you've shown long-term success and you've proven that you will actually show up and have the money to show up. That's how you get in. And uh, so I would encourage people to do that. And I really would encourage people uh, in high school rugby to find a tournament, whether, you know, if your state championship is early in the spring, whatever it is, find a tournament. Was that the, the Florida Invitational Showcase is another great example of something to just wrap up your season uh, and make it a little bit special. Um, having been a coach before, uh, I know that's a pretty cool way to end the year. All right, well, thanks also to everybody who contributes to Golf Rugby Report, our patrons and our anonymous patrons. Uh, couldn't do it without you. Really appreciate it, and it helps pay for things like travel and hosting fees and site maintenance fees. These are all very important, and you may have guessed travel is a little bit more expensive than it used to be. So thanks a lot for everybody who supports Golf Rugby Report, and we will see you next time.